podcast Tune in for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is the time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. to listen to the sick podcast with tony maradero 55 seconds left in the penalty a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time 
Boston four, Montreal three. Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> You're in the ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est la bonne chose. You found the dogs! John, you found the dogs! He found the dogs! And all together they worked a young team to the top. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup! Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination. It's going to be sick. Matt O'Han with you, the Hebrew Hammer. It's Friday. Happy weekend, everybody. On the Sick Podcast with you today, April 12th. 2024. All right, let's take care of business before we jump in to the exciting, exciting news of the day. Uh, the SICK Podcast brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Energy Transportation Group is a leading full-service logistics provider serving all of North America, driven to be different. We're also brought to you by Playground with over 30,000 square feet of new gaming, dining, and entertainment space. It's time to reacquaint yourself with playground world-class sushi triple a steaks live shows and a brand new poker floor and so much more located just over the mercy bridge only minutes away from downtown montreal playground experience the strip without the trip and of course, we're also brought to you by La Bitta TB Beer, brewed in Quebec and a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bitta TB offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bitta TB embrace your true nature and by accent assurance you know all all insurance isn't created equal and you know where to find the right solution for you accent insurance accent doesn't sell insurance they shop insurance for you to find the right product right on the money whatever your insurance needs home auto or business call the accent team today at 514-363-3636 and get the right solution at the right place, price. Visit their website at accentassurance.com. Okay, um, big news today. Um, Lane Hudson, we all know him, second round pick from a couple years ago uh, by the Montreal Canadiens, signed his entry-level contract. If you haven't heard, well, you've been living under a rock, you heard now. That's right. So, um this is exciting for many, many reasons. Um, obviously, a highly touted defenseman, highly touted offensive defenseman. And, you know, this is something the Canadians need. It's a boost of talent into their lineup, what a lot of people have been saying. And, yeah, he's going to join the team for the last two games of the season in Detroit. We're waiting on our guest, uh, Stu Cowan, to join us. Uh, he should be joining us any minute now. So uh, until then, it's just going to be me talking at you. Uh, if producer Shane wants to jump in, producer Shane, shout out producer Shane. He's the one uh, behind the scenes today. If you want to jump in, just pop your uh, pop your picture up if you can. Uh, if you want to do that at any point, no problem. But uh, yeah, so uh, Lane Hudson is has decided to sign his entry level deal. Boston University got eliminated from the playoffs, or uh, maybe it was the Frozen Four last night. Uh, Kent Hughes was in attendance actually for the game, so he decided uh, he saw it. He saw them get eliminated, and he went right down to the dressing room. I don't know if that's true, but he went right down to the dressing room and said, "Lane, let's go sign the contract." Took a little bit longer than expected. Uh, but ultimately, it got done. So very, very exciting news for the Canadians, for Canadians fans. We actually sent out a tweet at the Sick Podcast. Um, let's see, uh, at the Sick Podcast, we said one word. Give us one word to describe your uh, to describe Lane Hudson joining the Montreal Canadiens, and uh, got a lot of responses. It, it's always nice to see Montreal Canadiens fans uh, excited about the future 
And, you know, we, we've talked about it a lot, uh, you and I, this, um, this season, you and I being the viewer. And, um, you know, the Canadians are where they are right now organizationally. And I think that, you know, they're going to have one more year of troubles, we'll say. Uh, so, you know, it's not going to go as some people may think, but the excitement around these prospects is important to hold on to because listen, I know uh prospects, I'm one to I'm one to always say a prospect is never as high uh their their stock is as never as high as the day they got drafted. Well, that's it's it's really rare that it gets higher and Lane Hudson is one of those guys. So producer Shane just uh hit me with the message that he's ready to go. So producer Shane, pop pop yourself up because you are one of the people who host a sick podcast prospect show, the recruit draft cast is what you host. So uh, let's, what was your initial reaction when you heard that Lane Hudson is signing his ELs? Well, I mean, can't say I'm surprised, but I am very thrilled and, and excited about it. Right. Uh, he's, he's a player. He's a type of player that the Habs have not had. Uh, ever? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you think about it. Like that profile of player, dynamic. I mean, sure, PK Subban was was a dynamic defenseman mm. like that, very offensively minded. But to the level that Lane Hudson is, I don't know, man. I don't know. This this is just a different breed. I think he he's broken like every record for defenseman points in NCAA history, or some some crazy like that. So he's uh, <laughs> he's deserving of the hype. Uh, but at the same time, right, that that kind of player is going to take some time to adjust to the mm. NHL, right? Like, he's a perfect comparison because he's 5'10", I'm 5'10". I'm actually <laughs> heavier than him, though, right? So, like, I'm, I'm just picturing myself in an NHL setting. I know mm. I'd get smoked. You know what I mean? Granted, I don't have the wheels or the shiftiness that Lane has. So right. that's going to be his biggest asset. He's going to have to avoid contact. He's not, he's not going to be initiating contact, right? But that's not what you have him for. You got other guys in the lineup that are 6'3", 6'4", who can bang bodies. Not Lane Hudson. Lane Hudson's going to get you goals. He's going to get you assists. He's going to feed people on the power play. Ah, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm pumped. No, listen, I'm pumped. It, it's, I, I'm pumped too. You know, it, it's, it's one of those things that are super exciting. There's many layers to this thing, right? Because it, it's, we're seeing these conversations, you know, you've produced a lot of episodes that I've, uh, that I've done of the sick podcast uh, this year. You've heard the conversation before multiple times of, yep. you know, when the time comes, Kent Hughes is going to have a lot of decisions to make on the back end. And <laughs> We're seeing that happen right now. I mean, it's very early stages because, you know, let's pump the brakes. Uh, <laughs> Lane Hudson hasn't even played a game yet. But, <laughs> that's but you know, like, like listen, if they are the if he's the player they expect him to be or 75% of the player that he's expected to be, hmm. you got a lot of decisions because that back, that back end is loaded with defensemen right now. The pipeline is loaded with defensemen. And... Who knows? You know, you might get fifth overall. Uh, Zane Parekh. He he's a name that's uh, that's in uh, dra that's in the top five echelon of draft picks. Would it shock you if the Can if he you know made his way to the Canadians? He's sitting there at five, six, seven, wherever the Canadians end up drafting. Mm -hmm. Would it shock you if the Canadians drafted him? It wouldn't shock nope. me personally. So nope. we're seeing we're seeing this happen now. So. You know, who do you see? Let's say Lane Hudson is 75% of the player he's supposed to be. Who is, uh, who's making their way? Like who's first one, first man out of the lineup in your opinion? Ooh, it's, it's tough because you're at, you're at a point where, okay, it's not, oh, I need to get rid of this guy. It's like, okay, what can I get for this guy? Right. Mm -hmm. You, you have so much NHL caliber defenseman that you can field offers and get the best return. So you might not necessarily trade the worst of the defensemen, but there's, there's one defenseman that you're going to get more out of that, you know, is not going to fit in the lineup. So it's going to be a really interesting thing to, to, to follow for Kent. 
Um, and, and I watched this interview recently on, I think it was Daily Face Off with, with Frank Saravelli that mm. Kent did. And he was, he was talking about it pretty openly. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trade some of these Ds. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very out in the open. Uh, he's not afraid to say it right. <laughs> I mean, if Marc Benjavin was in that situation, he'd somehow spin it as though, oh, no, they're all staying. We're going to make it work. Uh, <laughs> I'm just glad we're beyond that. We're not stupid. We know something's got to give, right? And a lot of them, a lot of that depth hasn't even touched the AHL yet, right? We, we Adam Engstrom, Bogdan Kanyushkov, right? Uh, Jaden Strubel right. is in his first year. Jordan Harris, second year, right? J uh, Justin Barron is up and down. It it's it's all over the place. You don't really know what you're going to get out of, out of these guys. So trading young defensemen is so risky. We saw it with Sergachev, right? Just stings to hear it again, but you got to bring it up. <laughs> you just got to bring it up when you talk about that. Um, it, I don't know. It's hard to put a name, right? Because obviously most of the depth is on the left side. So you're thinking, okay, a lefty is going to go. But then if a guy like Jordan Harris or Jaden Struble is able to switch over to the right, become ambidextrous in a way, then that mm. opens more doors. You're like, okay, we got more options here. We can work with this. Maybe this guy's out. Maybe we keep this guy. I, I can't really pinpoint an odd man out. There's not really a player that I'm like, I don't like the upside. I don't see him you know, carving his spot on the team. I think almost all the, the big defensemen that we talk about could actually become a, a steady NHL defenseman. So it's, <laughs> I wouldn't want to trade places with Kent today. Nope. Well, the other side of that is that, um, the other side is that it's a great position to be in because you just got Absolutely. a ton of assets. You got so many assets. And I think uh, in his short tenure, as a as a general manager, um, Kent Hughes has proven that one of his strengths is maximizing assets um, for sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, if listen, I don't expect all these guys that he's acquired or that are in the pipeline to hit right. Like it's still we still don't entirely know what Justin Barron is going to be. He's had good moments. But right. he's not established himself. Um, you know, we want to see more from Jaden Struble. We want to see, you know, I think that Canadians want to see a lot more from Jordan Harris. Um, these guys are on the roster. They're conceivably a part of the future. But, yeah, they're, it's not, it's nothing is cemented, right? And, uh that's why I always say your 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 value is never as high, is never as high as when you were drafted for most players because uh, yeah. you know it's can you do you remember the hype when uh, Jordan Harris was playing at Northeastern and then it was like oh my god the Canadians are going to lose another defenseman because uh, he's not going to sign with the Canadians after yeah. he's done. He's done in college. And then Kent Hughes comes in, locks him up because there's the Boston connection and whatnot. And uh, listen, I think it's fair to say that there's still something to be desired from Jordan Harris. For sure. The, 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 the game hasn't translated fully to the NHL, right? And as a college player, Jordan Harris was phenomenal. Like, there, you can't take that away from him. He was fantastic. He is an NHL defenseman. I don't think I don't think he's an AHL defenseman. I think he has his place here. But is he a top four guy? I don't know, right? My, my thing with Harris is that he does everything well, but nothing exceptional. You know what I mean? There's, there's not that X factor that kind of puts him apart. If there was, it's probably his brain. He's a very cerebral yes. defenseman, yeah. very, you know, very, very smart, rarely makes a mistake, you know, chooses the best play at, at any given moment. But is that enough to keep you, you know, on, on an NHL roster with the Habs? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Jordan Harris. He's my type of defenseman, man. Just just you know what you're going to get out of him. You put him on the ice. You're like, I trust you. I know you're going to do well. And you know what? Recently offense the offense has been picking up he had a three mm -hmm. assist game granted you know you put in nine against philly but <laughs> nonetheless nonetheless nobody else got three assists right but he did 
Right. So you got to give him his flowers there. So if he's able to build on that out offensive output, then you might have something. Then you're like, okay, mm -hmm. we can use him in these kinds of situations. We can have a better idea what kind of defenseman we have here. Otherwise, if he's just there doing everything well, there's other guys that bring these X factors that he doesn't. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like it, it, that's that's how you have to like juggle and balance your lineup. Uh, you only have six defensemen, so they each have to bring something. Um, and, and I don't know. I don't know what Jordan Harris brings, but I hope I well, hope it works. Out. I love him. So that's the, that's the thing. And that's something I want to clarify because I'm sure I haven't looked yet. I'm sure uh, I'm getting murdered in the comments uh, for people are th thinking I'm ragging on Jordan Harris for no reason. <laughs> Uh, I'm not ragging on him like you. No, no, I, no. I think he's, I think he's an NHL defenseman. Um, you know, he gets spoken of very, very highly in the locker room. Uh, Stu says like if they, he didn't play hockey, uh, he would be he'd be running for president uh, one day. You know, <laughs> uh, so that's good. It's he's a very likable guy, and like you said, he does a lot of things well. This has been something though that I've always said about the Canadians blue line, and I said this about them last year is that there's a lot of guys or maybe too many guys that the, the the classic saying goes, oh, if you're a defenseman and you don't say their name, you're doing a good job. There's, you know what though? I, in Martin St. Louis system, I want them, like you want the defenseman to be a part of it. So I'll take a mistake every now and then if they're mm -hmm. going to be adding Di uh, like something on the offensive end. So I'll, I'll take that. That's why I always said, maybe there's some defensemen we're not talking about enough on the Canadians blue line. Maybe there's not enough of those defensemen that we're talking about. And uh, that's one of those things that, uh, that you were mentioning, you know, you bring an X factor, we're going to talk about you. Exactly. You know, I want to talk about the blue line as much as possible, not just in terms of the future of the blue line, but this blue line as it stands, you know, this is obviously in the future, um, as it stands is, it's going to carry you somewhere. Like I want to talk yeah. about the Canadians blue line, uh, as it, as if we're talking about the Colorado avalanche blue line one day, one day, um, with that producer Shane, thank you. Uh, Always we got him. He's, he, he's here. Stu Cowan of the Montreal Gazette. Stu, how you doing? I'm doing really well. Sorry for the delay. I hope you guys are good. Yeah, we're good. We're well. So we're obviously talking about the big news of the day um, of uh, Lane Hudson signing his entry level contract with the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, you know, I, what we were just talking about is um, what Kent Hughes is like, we're, like we've had this conversation a lot throughout the season of when these guys start to come up through the ranks, Kent Hughes is going to have some decisions to make now. I uh, prefaced it by saying let's pump the brakes because Jordan Harris, uh, Jordan Harris, um, Lane Hudson hasn't even played a game yet. But, you know, let's say he becomes 75% of the player we're expecting him to be, the Canadians are expecting him to be. Who's the, whose place does he really take? Because there's only six spots. There's a lot of good defensemen on the blue line, six spots, loaded cover, some good players on the blue line right now. It's going to be interesting to see. I, I wouldn't be shocked. If he ends up playing in Laval next season, I mean, they give him three game look or whatever many games you're going to play him for before the end of the season. Uh, if his team had been eliminated earlier, they would have got more of a look at him. Um, but it's hard to say. I mean, Jordan Harris is the guy, top of my head comes up. Uh, I think they're going to move at least one, if not two, other younger defensive during the offseason. I think Jordan Harris would be appealing to some other teams. Young guy. Not a big salary cap hit. Uh, he's played in the NHL. There's already a, a resume there for what he can or can't do in the NHL level. Uh, so I think he would be the, the guy I would think. But again, I wouldn't be surprised if they decide to send uh, Hudson to play a year in Laval like they did with Logan Mayu. Um, see how he does there. But it depends. I mean, the Canes have shown that if you're ready to play, they'll find a spot for you. Uh, but three games, they would have liked, obviously, to get a little bit more of a look at him this season. Uh, but three, whether he plays three, whether he plays two, uh, we'll see. Uh, the big question for him, obviously, is not talent, it's size, whether he'll be able to handle the mm -hmm. bigger players in the NHL, the grueling schedule, etc. They don't play as many games in U.S. college, but uh, the talent's definitely there, and boy, he's a guy they could use on a team that struggles offensively to have uh, 
another offensive line of defenseman is, is, will definitely help. So that's one thing um, I'm excited to see because, you know, I'm not a scout. Uh, I can't say I've watched many of uh, Lane Hudson's games. I'm limited to basically uh, the, the World Juniors yep. is what it is. Mm-hmm. I like what I saw, but it, that's all I'm limited to. Yep. So um, what I'm interested to see is everyone talks about his offensive game. I want to know what he adds on the de- on the defensive side of the puck. Because we see uh, the comparison I can make right now is because he has the elite talent. And I think it's fair to say that Mike Matheson has established himself as an elite skater, Mm -hmm. exceptional offensive talent, but he could have some brain farts every now and then. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing in in, uh, Lane Hudson's defensive profile or... Do, is his offensive talent just so much greater than his defensive abilities that it gets overshadowed? That's the thing. It's hard for me to say also. I mean, you see him at the World Juniors. Mm-hmm. I don't watch all the you know these university games or whatnot. I did see him at the evaluation camp last year, and he stood out. Like, his talent level was really incredible. I mean, every time you notice him, every time he's on the ice and every time he would skate with it. Similarities to Mike Matheson, without a doubt, although Mike Matheson's a bigger guy, bigger, stronger guy. And the, as I said, the concern with me is seeing Lane Hudson when he was interviewed at evaluation camp, just how skinny he is, especially from the waist down. Uh, it's a men's league in the NHL. Uh, even Jaden Struble has talked about, you know, when he first went to the AHL, how much more stronger the players were than in university. So defensively, again, it's hard to, to criticize his defensive play from not seeing him play. I know his coaches talked, uh, university coaches talked this season about how his defensive play has improved. But we're going to get to see. That's sort of cool. I mean, uh, we're going to get a chance to see. We've heard the hype about this guy since the Canadians drafted him and the offensive ability. And it's going to be a chance to see what he can do. And we've seen other smaller defensemen like Hughes and Vancouver who have thrived in the NHL. Um, so it's going to be interesting to watch. But, again, my big my concern is the physical strength. Is he going to be strong enough to play defense in the NHL, moving guys in front of the net, uh, taking hits behind the net, all those kind of things? Yeah, the thing you don't want, I mean, is I guess the the forward comparison would be uh, just, you know, recency and who's played on the Canadian, who's put on the Canadian sweater recently is um, Sean Farrell because we saw him at the end of last year. That's a good example. And he just, uh, he couldn't hack it in the few games that he played because he just wasn't strong enough. He couldn't win puck battles. He was getting bounced off the puck and there was a lot of hype about him coming up. He played a little bit in the NHL. Maybe he'll get bigger, stronger. Um, and that's that's a good comparison. I mean, you know, maybe it will be another example of that where he's just getting bounced around and he just can't isn't strong enough to play at this level. Or maybe his other skills are just so good that he can compensate for that. I mean, you know, Cole Caulfield is not a big guy either. Although Cole Caulfield is much filled out quite a bit since the day of the draft. I remember when mm-hmm. the, uh, they drafted. I was there in Vancouver and he walked by me and I said, "This kid's going to get killed." Like he was like, "Look, like a little boy." Uh, you know, he's he's bulked up. Uh, he's he's gotten stronger. It's not necessarily. Mm-hmm putting on a lot of weight or putting on a lot of muscle. It's just getting stronger. And uh, Lane Hudson, I mean, I haven't seen him since in person since evaluation camp last year. So maybe he has bulked up a little bit. Maybe he has added a little extra strength. But uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, I mean, the skill, talent level, skating, vision, all that's there. It's just, is he going to be able to be physically strong enough to play in the NHL? And Sean Farrell was an example of a guy, at least up until now, when he did get called up, he just wasn't physically strong enough. Well, that's it. It's just, I, and listen, it's only three games. And the positive, uh, the positive side of it is he has an entire off season where, you know, he's going to conceivably put on weight and put on muscle because mm-hmm. he knows he's going to be playing either in Montreal or in Laval next year. You need to be stronger yeah. to play in those leagues. These are men's leagues. Um, so that's going to be interesting to get those reports and to see how he just even by looking at him at development camp because you can Mm -hmm. kind of tell just by looking at someone if they've if they've put on muscle um aesthetically you don't even need the official weigh-in yet Mm -hmm. so it's really exciting and you know i was i was saying this for um we put out a tweet at the sick podcast um you know what give us one word to describe lane hudson joining montreal and the biggest observation i made was from canadians fans that answered that tweet so much excitement yeah i was gonna say exciting that's it it, it's it's so imp- – and I was saying at the beginning of the podcast, it's so important 
for Canadians fans to recognize and to be excited about these players because we've, we've said it all season long. Uh, you and I, we're not expecting the Canadians to make a significant jump next year. You know, maybe they could maybe fight for the playoffs, but, you know, we're seeing teams like Buffalo and Ottawa that are just, they bottom out and because they just don't have it. That's also a possibility for the Canadians. It's not an automatic thing, the five-year plan. No, of course not. So um, it's important to hold on to that excitement because you, this is what keeps you going through a rebuild. So I think Canadians fans, uh, you know, they should, they, they're excited. And I'm, excited to watch them. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to watch him play. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. as, as I said, the evaluation camp is every time he's on the ice, you notice them and the vision and the, that's why I'm excited. I'm excited to watch him and see what he can do. Just like Canadians fans are. Yeah. yeah. It's uh it's an exciting time because, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about, uh, David Reinbacher making his uh, debut in the AHL. And now we're uh, seeing Lane Hudson, those uh, that that cupboard of Canadians prospect defense bid. It's 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 you know, we're seeing the fruits of the labor right now. They're starting to they're starting to blossom in front of our very eyes. And Florian Jekai, Arbor's brother, getting a chance to play also. There's there's a lot of young talent coming up, and it's how they're gonna develop it. And look at how they developed your Sopkowski. And look at, you know, Alex Newhook's played really well. This the, the this organization since Jeff Gordon took over, you know, from from at hiring Adam Nicholas as a, you know director of hockey development, from hiring a sports uh, a mental performance coach who helped Joel Armia, uh, to hiring a, a chef, uh, to bringing in an al- analytics department, they've created an environment to help players develop. And not only young players, look at Yoel Armia, the, the difference in him this season. Oh, man. And we talked about working with the mental performance coach and how much that helped him. When Jeff Gordon took over the, as uh, executive vice president of hockey operations, he said he wanted to – I remember I had a one-on-one interview with him. I said, what's the number one thing you, need, you want to do? And I said, I want to modernize the team. And, you know, under Mark Berger, there's no analytics department. They didn't have the mental health. Like, it's, it's – they, they're and they've advanced light years as far as modernizing – uh, this team. And uh, right now, Uri Slavkovsky, you know, I, earlier in the season, I wrote a column saying he should be in the AHL. He doesn't look like he's ready to play in the NHL. But Marty St. Louis maintained all season and, and Ken Hughes that they were teaching him a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. They didn't want to throw everything at him, at him at once, not the whole book. They were teaching him page by page, as Marty St. Louis said. And we're seeing it's all coming together now, right? It's all coming together after only two years in the NHL. We're seeing him develop into what looks like a guy who could be a dominant power forward in the NHL. And he's only 20 years old. So Wayne Hudson uh, be the same thing with uh, Florian Jackai. It'll be the same thing. Um, the biggest problem for the Kings, one of the reasons they needed a rebuild is because they couldn't develop their young talent. There was so many, you go down the list of those first round picks who didn't pan out. And it looks like now they've solved that problem. And that's the biggest thing that's going to help this team moving forward. Yeah. And uh, you know what? Uh, this is a great segue. Is uh, we'll talk about uh, Yuri Slavkovsky because how can we not uh, after the week he's had? Um, it, it's really, it's really something quite amazing. Because I remember at one point this must have been maybe December, January. You and I were talking, and uh, this is in that phase that you mentioned that Martin Saint Louis stuck by Yuri Slavkovsky, mm-hmm. and you know. I've kind of felt like, okay, let's let's take the training wheels off a little bit and stop saying, you know, oh, he's playing well, but the points they're not there. Like, let's yeah. let's you know, we got to see results at the end of the day. It's a results based business, and then they started to happen. They it started to flourish in front of our very eyes. Um, I kind of feel how I felt. This is going to be a really out there. Uh, analogy, but stick with me here. Is um, I kind of feel like how I feel when I saw that play in New York for the first time, and uh, I saw there was an intermission right when it started picking up, and I was going, "Oh man, why you got to stop right now? Right when you start picking up?" And I kind of feel that way about the Canadian season. It's, a, it's yeah. kind of a shame that there's only three games left because I would love to see Uri Slavkovsky just keep soaring in the NHL. But the confidence, I, I'm pretty sure he'll go play at the World Championships. So we asked him about it, and he said like he'd love to go play. It depends if Canadian's manager wants him to go. I don't see why they wouldn't want him to go. Um, 
But the, he's going to have so much confidence coming into next season with the way he's finishing the season. Cole Caulfield also. We're seeing Cole Caulfield mm-hmm. scoring again. He's going to carry that confidence uh, uh, going into next season. Uh, you know, with Lane Hudson, maybe he'll gain some gain confidence that, you know, uh, yeah, I can't play in the NHL going into the next season. So there's a lot of a lot of good things to, to look at right now. And, you know, when you talk about Slavkovsky, it was interesting on Hockey Night in Canada last weekend when Kevin Bieksa, uh, re- reported that Suzuki had gone to Marty St. Louis in November when Slavkowski was struggling and said, put him on my line. I want like, mm-hmm. put him playing with me. I want to work with him. And I asked Marty about that after a recent game. And he said, he didn't remember Nick Suzuki coming into his office and saying, put him with me. But he says, I talked yeah. to him all the time. And it probably did come up in a conversation we had that he suggested it. And it, it speaks to the leadership that Nick Suzuki has developed. It speaks to just what a good player he is that he's been able to help bring Slavkovsky along. And also, Marty St. Louis is willing to just leave him there, right? Let him live and learn and live, learn from his mistakes. And, uh, you know, under previous Canadian's administration, young players weren't allowed to learn from their mistakes. You made a mistake, you were sent down, you were sent to Laval, you were a healthy scratch, whatever. And they ruined the development of a lot of players, I, I think, that way. And it's refreshing to see now. Um, there, I mean, that's part of a rebuild. You, you allow yourself, when you say you're rebuilding, you allow yourself to let young players make mistakes. And that's the key to a rebuild succeeding. And in your eyes, Slavkovsky, I mean, the, the, the improvement in his play from late October, early November, uh, you know, when I wrote a column saying he should go back to Laval, it doesn't look like he's ready or close to being ready in the NHL to what he is now is really quite remarkable. It's, it's really amazing. And the thing that I love the most about this regime versus past And this is this just speaks to, you know, you talk about they needed to modernize the organization, even the product on the ice. I remember, you know, back in when I 2006, let's go back to then. And they would call up some guy who's highly touted Mm -hmm. and take um, let's take Guillaume Latendresse for uh, for for argument's sake. This guy was the style of player that if he's in your lineup, you play him in your top six. That's his game. And yeah. they would just throw him on the fourth line. And then if it's not working, I mean, not with him, because he never kind of, I don't think he went down to Well, they started him right away. They, he started as an eight right after he was drafted too and mm. wasn't ready, but they didn't develop him like they did with Slavkowski. And you're right. I mean, there's so many guys that they would call up. Offensive player, play him three or four games on the third line or fourth mm-hmm. line, did nothing, send them back. And, uh, that's but that's it. And they yeah. just, that's not um, their game. No, no, they and play it's with. not their. Yeah. That's not their game. And there's no reason to have them in the NHL at that point. You know, it, it's, it, I think, you know, let's just say knock on wood, someone in the top six goes down in the next against Ottawa tomorrow night. They're probably going to call up Sean Farrell. They're going to call up. Uh, I don't even I don't even know on Laval who else is, uh, yeah. you know, an offensively uh, highly touted player. But that's the type of player that they would go with. They wouldn't go with the tough guy, you know, that's just happens to have the most points on the team. Mm-hmm. I, you know, they're placing guys where they're supposed to be at the NHL level. And that's what I love. And when they drafted Slavkowski, the idea was he was going to play with Suzuki and Caulfield. Uh, when I spoke with Slavkowski the day before the draft and asked why the Canadians should take him number one, he said, because I can play with Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield and score some goals. And uh, we're seeing it happen now. We're seeing it happen. And as, as again, just the development, Adam Nicholas, the work he's done with him. Uh, Slavkowski's talking about he's constantly sending him video clips of this player and that player and watch what this guy's doing. And Slavkowski was saying he was sort of surprised. He sent them some video of Patrick Kane. And he's like, I don't play like Patrick Kane, but he was telling him, like, watch – this play he does, or watch how he does this with the puck, or watch how he does whatever. So, the, the teach the, uh, they 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 built the foundation around these young guys to help them improve. That just it just wasn't there before. I mean, guys would struggle; they'd get sent down and just never heard from them again. They would, you know, they they were lacking in their hockey development department. They didn't have enough people. Uh, they didn't have enough modernized thinking people in that. Uh, I'm not a be all and end all analytics person, but it is part of the game. And the Canes were behind in that, and now they've they've, they've brought that in. Um, so Jeff Gordon, since you know, since he's taken over, and you got to remember, this is only year the second full season of a rebuild, and we're seeing signs of progress. And you know, as I've written before, the, the key is 
Kent Hughes needs excuse me, needs to find more forwards who can score, or this rebuild isn't going to work. You can't. Uh, but they're loaded on defense, as you mentioned. They're at a, a point now where they're going to have to start moving some young defensemen. They can't keep everybody. And how can't use packages out maybe with a draft pick or whatnot and, and maybe bring in a, one or two forwards who can fill those top six roles. And as you mentioned, put other players in their proper positions on or their proper chairs on the team. But they got they got to get more offense moving forward. And Lane Hudson is one guy who can help with that, especially on the power play. Um, you know, imagine a power play and your two point guys are Mike Matheson on one unit and Lane Hudson on another unit. That's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And it's just, again, uh, you know, there's the other factors of, you know, what Lane Hudson is going to learn from Mike Matheson yeah. as someone who's more senior on the team and is going to be, you know, he's already in a leadership role, going to be even in a bigger one, the older he gets, if he sticks around. And it's sort of cool that they're on the road too, because he's gonna, They're going to be together all the time, you know. Like it's not yeah. he's, if they're here, he'd go to practice, and then you know, the guys all go their separate ways. Maybe he'd hang out with one or two of the younger guys or something. But they're on the road. The whole team's going to be together. A uh, good environment for him to get a, a, adjusted to the team. You got to remember too, NCAA guys they can't play preseason games. They can't go to the regular training camp, so he hasn't had the same experience of being around the team as a guy coming up from junior. Uh, or a Slavkowski guy from Europe or whatnot. So um, this is a, it's a good experience for him. It's it's you know they're going to burn off the first year of his entry level contract, but I think that was the plan all along. They were going to sign him when he came out of university and get a look at him and let him just get a, a taste of what it's like to play in the NHL and go into the off season. Um, not that he wouldn't be motivated anyway, but maybe a little bit more motivated even to to maybe gain a little strength to do whatever whatever else he needs to do to be ready. When training camp comes next season, I think they're going to give him every opportunity to make the team. And if he's yep. not ready, I don't think there's anything wrong with Lane Hudson playing a year in Laval. Go down to Laval, show what you can do, get used to playing against stronger, tougher opposition. And uh, if he plays well down there, and as, as you, you can never, you know, nobody's ever said that you left the guy too long developing, right? It's sort of you mm. hear guys were rushed up too quickly. So um, we'll see what happens. But as I said, uh, I'm excited is the right word. I'm excited to see what Lane Hudson can do. So speaking of the Canadians, uh, I, you know, and Lane Hudson, just to close the book on him, uh, I think the last I saw on Twitter, Chris Johnston tweeted that uh, he's going to join the team in Detroit. I okay. think that's the last I saw. Um, so, I mean, hey, you want to read into – you want to have fun and read into conspiracy theories. There's a very important game tomorrow night for the Canadians and the Ottawa Senators in terms of uh, standings and uh, who's going to finish above mm. who and what draft position you might get or draft lottery odds you'll get because uh, the winner of that game will almost certainly finish in front of the other one uh, for better, uh, for worse odds, I yeah. should say. It might also uh, be a case they just want him he's go back to – Get his stuff, uh, pack up his stuff. Get a, get a practice in, get, get a, a skate in. Yeah, get a skate in or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's conspiracy theory maybe, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think it's more a case of rather than rushing him immediately in, they're going to give him a yeah. day or two to, to you know, pack up his stuff from university and just get his mind or head around the fact that he's actually coming up to the NHL. Yeah, so uh, that's going to be exciting. Again, uh so one more thing to watch for uh, three games left in the Canadian season is um, listen, I would love to see uh, Samuel Montembeau, just the way he's playing. He's playing very good hockey has been pretty much all season. Uh, would love to see him again, go to the uh, go to the world championships like he did last year. Mm -hmm. I think he, uh, got a good rapport after what happened last year with uh, Hockey Canada. So that that's also another exciting thing. It's just, you know, we always say goalies develop slower than traditionally mm -hmm. defensemen and then obviously forwards. Um, would love to see him just get more reps on a big stage for just – it's again, reps, reps, reps is all I want for these guys for when the games, uh, the games in Montreal start to really count. Yeah, I didn't ask Montembeau, but I think Arpon Basu of the Athletic did, and I think he was sort of non-committal. He wasn't certain yet, which I can understand. He won a gold medal there last year, like he's been there, done that type of thing. Um, longer season, maybe he wants some time off, but you know, once the season's over, maybe he'll change his mind and decide he wants to go. But uh, 
I agree. I mean, Lane Hudson, he's going to end up playing for the U.S. team or maybe Cole Caulfield's on the U.S. team also. Um, it'll be interesting to see what – having old Caden Gooley has said he's really interested in going to play for Canada. Nick Suzuki possibly. As I mentioned earlier, Yaris Slavkowski said he'd love to go uh, play at the Worlds. Um, but yeah, this is, you can never have too many reps. You know, as Marty St. Louis likes to say, you can't buy reps. Uh, but with Montembeau, like, I wouldn't be shocked or – uh, if he said, I'm, no, I'm not going to go this year. I'm just going to enjoy the long break. I think he's proven himself this season, to me anyway, that he can be a legitimate number one goalie in the NHL. Not the number one goalie who's going to play 65 games like Carey Price used to be. Uh, those guys are going to be gone. Like, yeah, those, days are over. Yeah. those days are over. But he's a guy who can give you, you know, 50, 50, 50 games, 55 games, and give you a chance to win in just about all of those games. You know, there's – maybe three, four games a season where he hasn't played that well. You know, he got pulled recently in one of the games by Marty St. Louis, but he's just been, he's been consistent. He's been consistent. It does, nothing seems to rattle him or phase him. Um, I think he's done a really good job. I think he's proven already that he, he's a legitimate number one goal in the NHL. I got to, I got to agree with you. And uh, it remains to be seen because he's only been on the Canadians and the Panthers mm-hmm. it remains to be seen if he's a legitimate number one goalie on a team that wants to contend but from what he's shown i mean listen there have been games where i don't want to say the canadians dog it because they don't dog it very often yeah. but let's say they take their foot off the gas a little bit drive yeah. 20 kilometers below the speed limit we'll say yeah. and he just gets peppered and he is up to the task and he is standing tall and you know it's not a playoff game however by that same account the teams that the Canadians have been playing need to make the playoffs. They need to win games, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, so the Flyers, um, the team, you know, they blew out the Flyers, a team that's oh, uh, <laughs> it's falling apart. And you know, Montembeau said he's, he's shown to me that he can be a number one goalie. Uh, Caden Primo, I'm still not a hundred percent certain. He's got one year left in his contract, but boy, Jacob Fowler is going to the NCAA championship, and he has just been amazing this season. Uh, you know, we're talking about Lane Hudson maybe playing next year in Laval, maybe. Jacob Fowler joins him there if that's a, you know, and uh, so the Canes are looking between, you know, Montebo can carry the, carry the torch for a little while, but it looks like uh, Jacob Fowler um, could be the Canes goalie of the future. It's certainly looking that way. Uh, could be. And last thing uh, I want to talk about before we close the book on the Canadians and just touch on the other news of the day Um is we, we mentioned him very briefly. You mentioned it that he's starting, to, he's scoring again. Cole Caulfield, just what a way to end the season. Yeah. Six game point streak right, right now, and uh, five goals in six of those games. Just, you know, for all the talk of, oh man, he doesn't, maybe he doesn't have it. Uh, he's hurt. Uh, he's having a down season. He can't handle a full season. Listen, the guy's got 62 points. And he's played a full, oh, well, up to this point, a full season. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And he's looked more like the Cole Caulfield from last season, the last little while. Um, it's hard to explain, you know, his shooting percentage is at like 8%, like half of what it was last season. And that's 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 going to change. Like he's just, he's too got too good of a shot and he gets too many shots that, you know, eventually they're going to go in. You know, I wrote a thing uh, earlier the, in the week, all the players have, Above him in total shots uh, per goal, all had at least 33 goals or 30 more than 30 right. goals this season. So he's like, I think it's just one of those years where the puck just hasn't gone in for him like it has in the past. And, you know, he, the, the mm-hmm. good thing is it came off the shoulder surgery. As you said, lots of questions. Can he actually play a full season? Yes, he can. Uh, and he stayed healthy. And the goals are, you know, he knows how to score. As Marty St. Louis says, I'm not going to teach him how to score goals. I can teach him how to be a better hockey player. And we've seen many signs about how Cole Caulfield has become a better hockey player, a better two-way hockey player. Nobody back checks as hard as him. You know, he's, he, he's, he flies all over the ice. Um, maybe came, came a little predictable with some of his shooting or whatnot. Uh, but, you know, I'd be shocked if he doesn't score 30 goals next season. Uh, I think this is just one of those seasons where the puck didn't go in as much. And, you know, Pat Hickey loves to say, you know, if you're a 30 goal scorer, that means there's at least 52 games you don't score. Right. And so you got to be able to do other things also. And he's shown he can do other things. And the other thing, Slavkovsky, Slavkovsky emerging as a legitimate goal scorer now. 
and that big body in front of the net, that's going to open up more space for Cole Caulfield. You know, it used to be early in the season, they were just key on him, right? Suzuki's going to him. Suzuki's going to him. Suzuki's going to him. Now Suzuki's got two ways he can go. And uh, both guys have shots and both guys can score. So I think that's only going to help Cole Caulfield moving forward. And maybe that is what hurt him a little bit this season. Maybe guys were keying, really keying on him when that line was on the ice. But they can't do that anymore. Not the way Slavkowski's coming along. Well, that's it. And, you know, the biggest uh, the biggest thing for me is, like Pat Hickey likes to say, you know, you're going mm-hmm. at least 52 yeah. games without scoring. You got to make sure you could do other things. He He's shown that. And yeah. I think a season like this, adds to his toolkit um so to speak uh because listen this this is conceivably going to be the line of the future the first line of the future for the canadians of suzuki centering slavkovsky and caulfield um you know unless something crazy happens and you know it would be a better situation than that but if we're if we're running with that theory who cares who has more assists than goals? As long as the line's scoring, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, as long as the line is performing, mm-hmm. you know, Suzuki could have 40 goals and Caulfield could have 60 assists. I don't think anyone would complain about that. No, I mean, going into the season, I think most Canadians fans thought that, you know, Cole Caulfield would have more than 25 goals right now. I mean, some yeah. people were saying 40, 50, uh, uh, whatever, but I don't think anybody thought he'd have a chance to finish the season with 40 assists. You know, he's got 37 assists right now, um, mm-hmm. and and again that that you know that number one line, unless you know they bring in some star player through a trade or they win the draft lottery, or something, that's going to be that's going to be their number one line for the foreseeable future, and they're all just going to get better. I mean, Nick Suzuki keeps getting better every year, every game. Cool. Slavkowski, as I mentioned, the improvement's remarkable. And I think Cole Caulfield also has improved in many ways. And Cole Caulfield's a goal scorer. He's going to score goals. And it's really hard to explain how his shooting percentage dropped as much as it did this season. But the shots on goal didn't. Like, the shots keep coming. Well, and that's it. And that's a good thing because shooters shoot. you got to have the confidence to shoot. And that's not leaving for him. Mm-hmm. Um, the last thing I would say on that Sorry is that, that you know, know. Yeah, your fire alarm's going off. My wife's uh, cooking something upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, that's all right. Um, the last thing I'll say on the, the the expectations of 50, you know, that some people were saying this year and yeah. even last year, is that if you take a look at the goal leaders this year of the NHL, there are four guys who have hit 50. It is hard to hit 50 yeah. like people just toss that number out there as if it's some arbitrary thing that yeah. is a tough number to hit you know two of them are well one of them is going to eventually give ovechkin unless barring a knock on wood devastating injury career altering injury to austin matthews he's going to give ovechkin and gretzky a run for their money for that scoring uh record one day in austin matthews oh, yeah. uh, nathan mckinnon is in the art ross race He's uh, one of the best players in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And the other two, great story in Sam Reinhart and Zach Hyman, another great story, Mm -hmm. plays with Connor McDavid. There's an effect there. So those are the four guys. That's it. Yeah. That's when people think it's a hard number to hit. I'm pretty sure we talked for the beginning of the season of coffee. We were saying 30, I think, like rank 30 would be a good season for him. And you know, for uh, Sapkowski, 15 ish would be a good season. It's 15 20 would be good. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he's there, right? And Caulfield's yeah. just below. I mean, who knows what he's been scoring recently. Maybe we'll get 30. <laughs> go on a little That's it. But, um, yeah, 50 goals in the NHL. Is, is, and Austin Matthews, it's really incredible what he's doing. Like, it's it's amazing to, that a guy can score like that in the NHL. Oh, man. It, it's just – it's it's nuts. Like, it's uh, – he, he's – as you mentioned, like, Ovechkin scored – so many of his goals from that same spot, right? You know where he's yeah. going to shoot from. You know, Matthew scores from everywhere. Like, he just, his, like, you, you never, his goals come from all over the place. I'd like to see a, a, a graphic of, like, where all, oh, yeah. You see it go. They'd be yeah. all over the place, right? It's it's all over the map. He's, he's an incredible goal scorer. And, you know, the thing with Cole Caulfield, he doesn't have the size, obviously, Austin Matthews has, which is a big advantage. But his shot, Cole Caulfield's shot is elite. And, uh, you know, the pucks are, as I said, I'd be going into next season. I'm not going to say he's going to score 50 goals because 50 goals is huge, but I would be 
you know, heading into this season, I thought if he could reach 30, be good. At, I'd be really surprised if he doesn't score 30 next season. Yeah. Like next season, I'm, I see him between 30 and 40 goals next season. 50 goals is a lot of goals. And those guys you mentioned with the 50 goals, a lot of them come in front of the net too. Bigger bodies that can get in front there and score the goals we're seeing stuff Coffee score now. That's not Caulfield's game. He's more of an outside shooter. Uh, so to me, if he can get uh, you know 30 goals next season, 30, 35 goals would be a good year for him next year. And, and the last thing on the uh, on the 50 goals thing is you can't, unless it is Austin, unless you, the player's name is Austin Matthews, Nathan McKinnon, back in the day, of Alex Ovechkin and Nikita Kucherov. Those are four guys. You, if you're, if you're there on your team, you can expect fifty. Yeah, Mike Bossy was. That's the other pretty, one. pretty. But that's pretty much yeah. it. Yeah, that's if it. Yeah. Expecting, if you're expecting fifty, you're kind of setting yourself up to be disappointed. So um, fifty is a huge, huge, huge number. Yeah. So I mean, we'll last year, Austin Matthews scored 40 goals last year. You know? Yeah. And then everyone said he was finished. And then he I mean, came yeah, back with a 40, And, uh, you know, I'm just looking at his goal to- totals here. You know, 37. Well, since he entered, entered the NHL, 40 as a rookie, which mm-hmm. is remarkable. And then 34, 37, 47, 41, 60, 40, and 68. So as you and say, that's 40 goals three games to go. And, and that's when you're looking at Cole Caulfield. Why did he only score 40 last year? Puck wasn't going in. You know, sometimes yep. this, they talk about puck clock, bad puck clock. It just sometimes, sometimes the pucks go in more than they should. And sometimes they don't go in as much as they should. And Har- Raphael Harvey Pinard, like he's got one goal. His shooting percentage is like 4% this year. Last year was 24%. Yeah. It's like... You know, how, Law of averages. How Law did he ever shoot twenty four percent? But how did he only shoot like four percent or whatever he's at this season? It's hard to explain. So last last thing we're going to touch on quickly before we get out of here is uh, the other news of the day that I mentioned, which is uh, amazingly, Mark Stone. He's yeah, cleared he's to skate. He's cleared to skate. Oh my god, what a coincidence! Great yeah. timing. Oh, yeah, Vegas. great timing, right? Come back while well, he's not ready to play, but he'll be ready for the playoffs. <laughs> It, uh, oh, it's just um, it, it's one it's of those amazing. loopholes in the NHL. They're not breaking any rules, as I've we've said before. It's ridiculous that a meaningless regular season game in you know, March or whatever, or early April, between two teams that are not going into playoffs, salary caps in in effect. But Stanley Cup playoffs start, <laughs> salary cap doesn't matter anymore. It's, oh, it's ridiculous. It's 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 crazy, and uh, I mean, I guess we should we could talk about for thirty seconds the other news of the week, which was Salt Lake City. It might happen, yeah. you know that that relocation might happen a lot sooner than it yeah. than expected. And you know when they talk when when Elliot Friedman or back in the day Bob McKenzie or Darren Dreger mm-hmm. send out a tweet that's saying yeah. it could happen by April eighteenth. Yeah. I would bet money that it will happen yeah, by they're, April. They're plugged 18th. in with the NHL guys, and and finally somebody convinced Gary Bettman that hockey in Arizona isn't working. <laughs> you know? Oh man! Like how many how many referendums do they people have to have there to say no? We're not we don't want another <laughs> arena. We're not building another arena. How many more years are they going to let them play in a five thousand seat arena that has empty seats in it? Some games. How it, it's just been insane that yeah. they've allowed this thing in Arizona to last as long as it has, and finally. Uh, you know, Gary Bettman is a very stubborn man. Doesn't like to ever admit that he made a mistake. Finally, somebody was able to uh, get him. The, it's, it's time. It's time. Enough already. It's time. I, I think it was. It's a lot easier to swallow because it's in the area, so you could still kind of say you got hockey close to the desert. Yeah, in Salt Lake City. Yeah. Wow. Listen, it, that's uh, that's Gary Bettman for they you. They got an arena ready to go in there. They got an owner ready to go in. But it's. I mean, that Arizona thing was just. I mean. You know, well, I, I, I covered the game last year. Coming I, out. I was on the road with the Canadians last year when they played in Arizona, and it was like uh, it was like a game at the McGill Arena. That's the same thing. It was it was a joke. I mean, the press there was no press box. You were sitting in the stands with like a wooden piece of wood in front of you for uh, mm. a desk. And it, it, I mean, it was a great place to watch a game. There's no bad seats, of course. but like, behind <laughs> the net, there's not even seats. It's benches. You're sitting on a bench watching an NHL hockey game in a 5,000 seat arena. It's just, it was, it was a joke and it shouldn't, it shouldn't have been allowed to get to that point. Like it, they should not have been allowed to play it. Like they, they should have been gone. Yeah. Before they had to go to that arena. It's embarrassing that it, they allowed it. And you know, hockey related revenue 
you know, you're a player and you're playing paying escrow on your contract and you're looking at a team playing in a 5,000 seat arena, how much, how much hockey related revenue are you losing every year by, by allowing that to happen? And, you know, all the talk about another arena, another arena. So now you're going to have a bigger arena with more empty seats. In Arizona, you know, in Utah, they'll go to Utah. Hockey will be new. It'll be big. It'll be like when yeah. they went to Seattle. People will be pumped to go. They'll. Uh, it's. You know, it, it seems like it seems like it was such a logical thing to do. The only illogical thing is how it took Gary Bettman and the NHL so long to finally pull the plug in Arizona. And hey, look! Uh, by the time you and I are talking next week on uh, April nineteenth, there may be a team in <laughs> set in Salt Lake City. I wonder what Very they call. Well. Them. I wonder what they call them. The Yetis. Yes. <laughs> the Utah, the Utah Yetis is like the weirdest one ever. Right? Like, if you think of Utah, I don't think about jazz music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it'll be the Utah Yetis. There you go. Yeah. Actually, it'll be something that doesn't end with an S. Oh, right. Yeah. It's got to be uh, – I wouldn't even know what it would be. Yeah, You've got good like skiing the, there, but the, the Avalanche or are – The uh, Rams or whatever, those days are gone. Yeah. Probably sort of uh, weird names. All right, Stu, thank you very much for joining me, and uh, we'll talk next week. All right, have a good night. All right, that was Stu Cowan. I'm Matt O'Han. I'll catch you next week. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination.